depending on where you're located, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Nonprofit Governance and the Role of the Board in Financial Management. Before we get started, I would like to go over some items that you should know uh, before today's webinar. First, we've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks very similar to what's on the screen right now uh, on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You should be able to hear the presentation now if you listen to the webinar by a computer speaker or headset. If you would prefer to join over the telephone only, just select telephone option on your screen. The dial-in information will be displayed. Please feel free to submit your questions anytime during the webinar through the question team. We will collect those questions and address them today during the question and answer session following the presentation. In addition, the full PowerPoint for today's presentation will be made available online shortly after the webinar. Now for today's webinar, there are a few housekeeping tasks that I'd like to take care of before we go into our formal uh, material. First, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dina Osley, Director of Research at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, a leading academic institution dedicated to increasing the understanding of philanthropy and improving its practice through research, teaching, training, and civic engagement. I'll also be serving as co-presenter for today's webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to now introduce my co-presenters, Tom Pollard who needs no introduction. For today's webinar, he is the Program Director of the National Center for Charitable Statistics at the Urban Institute. The National Center for Charitable Statistics, NCCS, is a national repository of data on the nonprofit sector in the U.S. NCCS's research includes the Nonprofit Almanac, the annually updated nonprofit sector and briefs, and a variety of other research reports and, and briefs that focus on the nonprofit sector. Tom is very well known to many of you. He's been published in numerous scholarly journals and is frequently quoted in the national media. In addition, we have another distinguished panelist for today's presentation, Dennis Gerhardt. The third presenter today is a vice president of Moody's Higher Education and other nonprofit ratings team, providing credit ratings, research tools, and analysis that contribute to a transparent and integrated financial markets. Dennis covers a diverse portfolio, including large public university systems, complex academic medical centers, and leading not-for-profit organizations throughout the U.S. Dennis has authored multiple publications, including the Moody's Rating Methodology for Nonprofit Organizations, as well as special comments on investment liquidity in college sports. We're honored to have this panel present on their various research topics. And I also would like to mention that today's webinar is the second of a three-part series focusing on the role of the nonprofit sector and governance in nonprofit financial health and well-being. The discussion today will include what nonprofit form 990 is about nonprofit governance, research on whether and how board members are involved in nonprofit financial management, and the key role that financial management and play in Moody's credit rating for nonprofit organizations. I want to remind you that all the presenters will be available at the end of the webinar to answer questions, but please uh, feel free to send us your questions anytime during the webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to my fellow panelist, Tom Pollock from NCC. Thanks, Una. The focus of this brief presentation will be on telling you about the, the results of, uh, of a study we did using IRS Form 990 data this past year, um, looking at both governance practices and policies and their relationship to a variety of different factors, um, ranging from organizational size and activities to, um, to the independence of the boards. Uh, the focus will be primarily on looking at current practices uh, our latest data, unfortunately, it was 2010 at the time this, this study was completed. Um, but then we also will provide some comparisons between 2010 and some earlier work that my colleague Francie Ostrauer did back in 2005. Um, you know, particular importance here will be the theme that you know, the board and organizational characteristics um, are clearly 
intimately tied to the, the adoption of certain governance practices and, and policies. And we'll see how that, that plays out over the next handful of slides. In the world of publicly traded for-profit organizations, uh, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which although it didn't directly impact the nonprofit sector, it certainly had major spillover effects, um, probably for, for the better, in, in the sector. Um, in 2004, uh, Senator Grassley held hearings um, under the office of the Senate Finance Committee, um, looking at a variety of practices in, in the nonprofit sector. Uh, these well-publicized hearings led to the creation of the Independent Sector Sponsored Panel on the Nonprofit Sector, um, which released a, a major report with recommendations in 2007. In parallel, the, the IRS redesigned the Form 990 for, for the first time systematically in, in decades, between 2007 and 2008, and added a major section specifically on governance, uh, arguing that it had the authority to include these questions because good governance um, was strongly associated with improved tax compliance. Form 990 is not only used at the federal level, but it's also used by state regulators and, of course, the public, um, which certainly adds, I think, to the value of these questions more broadly. When we think about the role of the boards, um, you know, we can think broadly about the duties of care and loyalty and of the board's role as both monitor and, and strategy, strategy setter. Um, these questions, I think, touch on all four of these so dimensions of, of the board's role, but I think especially the, its monitoring role. A look at part six of the full form 990, which, which lists the various questions that we will examine. By way of background, um, approximately 40% of organizations um, filing full form 990s had boards in the five to 10 member range. Um, as you can see, very very few had had boards with fewer than three members. Um, around 12 percent had more than 20 members. Uh, size varies dramatically by by the size of the the organizations themselves. Um, the median size for organizations with less than $250,000 in receipts was uh, seven members, compared to around 15 members for organizations with more than $10 million in in, in revenue. Most of the variables we'll look at are, um, are, are variables that really cannot be changed by the organizations themselves, but, but one, one can be, and that is board independence. And um, the Form 990 provides a very technical definition that the IRS uses for board independence, but more, more broadly we can think of it as a board member is independent if, the, if he or she receives no material financial benefit, either directly or indirectly from the organization. So what we see when we look at the distribution um, of board independence on the Form 990, we see that you know, the overwhelming majority, 82%, um, um, had three quarters or more of their board members identified as independent. So that means typically they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not staff, they're not receiving any substantial uh, financial remuneration from the organizations or, or related organizations, um, we would have every reason to expect that they would in fact be able to act independently and in the best interests of, of the organizations. Um, approximately 14.5% of the organizations um, had less than half of their board members identified as independent. Um, and then there are very small percentages in the from half to three quarters range as well. Moving over to the various policies that and, and practices that we that we'll be examining here, um, we see that a little less than two thirds, 62 percent of organizations uh, said on their 990s that they had a conflict of interest policy in place. Um, less than half, 42 percent, had whistleblower policies. Nearly half had document retention and disruption policies in place. Um, nearly two-thirds had compensation review and approval processes in place for determining the salary of the, the chief 
staff officer, whether that person is called a CEO or executive director. Um, this, quite frankly, seems surprisingly low to, to, to me, um, given that um, an organization can be subject to a much higher level of scrutiny if it has not gone through a formal process of having its comp its compensation practice practices um, reviewed. Um, less, less than half also had compensation review and approval processes for other employees besides the, the CEO or executive director. Um, nearly two-thirds had their financial statements compiled, reviewed, or audited by an independent accountant. And nearly 80% um, said they, they used an independent audit committee or had a committee specifically designated for purposes of reviewing an audit. How's this changed from 2005 to 2010? Um, you know, in general, we see, I'd say, positive changes um, for those interested in improving governance practices in the sector, um, with a couple of possible exceptions. Uh, the con percentage of organizations with conflict of interest policies um, jumped about 10 percentage points from around half to, to 62%. Um, oddly enough, the, the percentage with whistleblower policies actually fell from 52 to 42 percent. Um, document retention and destruction policies increased quite dramatically from, from 30 percent to nearly 50 percent. Um, the percentage having what are typically fairly expensive audits or, or financial or reviews of financial statements um, declined very, very slightly. Um, I, would, I would be cautious about reading too much into the, such a small drop here. Um, and then the percentage reporting the use of an audit committee or, or designated committee increased well, more than double from 20% to, to nearly half. Looking now at the, the, the factors that help us understand why organizations are likely to have or, or, or the correlates of organizations having these particular policies in place. Um, not surprisingly, we see organization size as being positively associated with all of these different policies and practices. Um, jumping, down, jumping down to the bottom, we also see age correlated positively with all of these practices as well. Um, we see as well government organizations receiving government grants. They are also more likely to have these policies and practices in place. Teasing apart the, the sector further, um, we, we do see differences between different, um, different subfields. So we see arts organizations um, perhaps surprisingly being less likely, all other factors considered, to have these, these policies and practices in place, while we see the healthcare field being, being more likely to have these policies and practices in place, even after accounting for size differences, say, for example, among hospitals. That, tend to dominate the, the certainly the financial side of, of this of that field. Uh, for the for the other for the other factors that we looked at, um, in some cases we see they had no bearing at all. In other cases they may have had a positive bearing for some some of these policies while a negative bearing on others. So we we we'll kind of ignore the, the rest of these variables for the remainder of this presentation. Teasing apart the, the, the use of these policies and practices by size of organization, not surprisingly, shows huge differences. Um, among the, the, the smallest organizations, those with $250,000 or less in total expenses, um, only around less than 20% of the organizations reported having whistleblower policies, compared to around 9 of 10 of organizations with more than $10 million in expenses. Um, the variation among other practices tended to be somewhat somewhat less, but, but still quite substantial. So for conflict of interest policies, for example, four of ten of the smallest organizations had, had those policies in place. Well, virtually all the largest organizations had, had the conflict of interest policies in place. As Una said, we will be making this presentation available online, so I, I won't go into any more detail at this point. But if you have specific questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A period. Um, 
looking, looking further at, at the distribution of practices by types of organizations we see in, in general, arts, arts are at the, the, the bottom of the, the distribution and healthcare at the top, pretty much all across the board. I won't go into any, any more detail here. We also wanted to, to look at both both field of activity as well as size, and we do so in this table here. And what we see is the same patterns generally applying, although although there are some exceptions. Um, of particular interest we see among the largest organizations, those with five million dollars or more in revenue, practices were pretty consistent even between arts and, and healthcare. This is the two fields that were sold at the extremes of the distribution. So among lar the largest arts organizations, for example, we see 99.1% of them having conflict of interest policies. Um, in contrast, we see only 97.6% only of, of the largest healthcare organizations having the same policies in place. And we see sort of a similar pattern emerging across each of the policies with um, arts organizations tending to, to actually look a little better than than the large healthcare organizations on a couple of different measures, which are uh, highlighted in, in blue on this on this chart. Skipping over to, to the question of board independence, um, as you saw earlier, board independence is a significant factor in determining the likelihood of organizations adopting these measures. So this is highly correlated with it, and in this table you can see that see that borne out. Uh, so among small organizations, for example, those that have less than two-thirds of their board members being independent, um, only around a quarter of, of those organizations had conflict of interest policies in place. In contrast, for organizations that had at least two-thirds of their members being independent, we see half of those organizations with conflict of interest policies in place among that, that smallest tier of organizations. In this case, divides those with less than 500,000 in revenue. We do see substantial variation among the mid-sized organizations as well. However, at the, at, on the larger end of the spectrum, there, there is relatively little variation between organizations that, that reported lack of independence and those that reported independent boards. We also just point out that the, the stunning difference in the, in the use of, of independent accountants um, among independent boards versus non-independent boards. Here among the smallest organizations, we see only around 28% of organizations in the, that smallest category with, with audits or financial reviews compared to, to more than half of, of those with, with independent boards. And we can certainly talk more about this in the Q&A period about you know, whether that's, that's prudent or not, and there certainly are arguments um, on both sides of that issue, especially for the smaller organizations. As I noted before, um, organizations that receive government grants are significantly more likely to, to have these policies and procedures in place. Um, what direction causality flows here, I, I, I think is, is somewhat of an open question. Um, do they adopt these policies because they receive government grants, or are they more likely to receive government grants because they already have these policies in place? There are, there are a range of questions that I think you know, we, we, that still need to be investigated here. Um, at any rate, what you see is all across the board, for each of these policies, those that, that receive government grants do, do have substantially more, more of these policies in place. Um, we also break break down the, the governance policies um, by by the level of independence here, and, and once again, the pattern is is quite consistent with what we've seen earlier, with those with independent boards being far more likely to have have the practices in place. So, in, in conclusion, um, you know, we certainly see that organization size matters a great deal. Um, you know, the majority of organizations. I would say do have good governance policies and, and practices in place. Um, obviously, this, this 
study really is, is looking at correlations. Um, causation is, is more difficult to tease out, but we certainly think this, this study is suggestive of, of the value of independent boards, especially. Um, and it suggests a range of other questions, and I'm going to turn the floor over now to Una, who can begin to tease apart some of these questions and potential answers. Thank you. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm going to sort of take up where Tom left off by studying and uh, providing a deeper dive into aspects of board governance as it relates to financial management. So the study that I'll be talking about today is a study that was conducted by the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy to investigate nonprofit financial literacy and explore how knowledge informs practice. In this analysis, this part of the webinar, I'll be talking about the role of board governance, specifically around financial decision making. But this is part of a broader project to promote discussion and research on financial literacy and management in the nonprofit. Our study was conducted in 2010, so right after the end of the Great Recession, where there was a lot more emphasis on how the nonprofit sector would emerge from the recession and the role that transparency and accountability can play in strengthening organizations. Uh, to provide further context, there had been some recent changes in the Form 990, and there, was a, there were sort of questions and debates taking place within the field as to how this would change the way nonprofits operated. In our sample today, it's a national sample of over 500 organizations, and they range uh, between $100,000 in annual revenue and $100 million. We do not, ex we do not include higher education, hospitals, and international nonprofits in this analysis. Just very quickly, a profile of the organizations surveyed. We do have a range of subsectors represented, including health and human services, arts and culture, civic and environmental organizations, as well as education. And you can see that we have quite a range of organizations by size, with the bulk of the organizations in our sample uh, around $1 million to $5 million in revenue. Now, Tom mentioned the role that government grants can play in decision making and changing practice. We actually emphasize the role that charitable donations can play in uh, shaping organization practice. And I just want to mention that the organizations in our sample range in the extent to which uh, they receive charitable donations and the size of the donations that they receive, with the majority of the organizations in our sample receiving between 100,000 and 500,000 in charitable donations in the previous year, which was 2009. Now, turning to perhaps what turned out to be one of the more interesting and perhaps controversial findings in our study. Now, if we benchmark this with the uh, national sample that Tom referred to, we found that about 60% of our sample, these are mostly mid-sized nonprofits, did not actually have an independent audit committee that was separate from the finance committee. And about 40% did, in fact, have an audit committee. Now, you can see that the presence of an audit committee does vary by size. With the larger organizations, about 60% of them do have an audit committee, very much in line with Tom's uh, research and findings. Uh, this, as I said, is a really interesting question because following the revisions to the Form 990, there's been more interest and um, recommendations given to nonprofits that having an independent audit committee can play an important role in financial oversight. The way that is constructed may vary from organization to organization. We would love to hear questions and comments about that. Now, in addition to having information about the presence of an audit committee, our survey also posed the question uh, to the respondents about the composition of the audit committee. To what extent did audit committees have internal versus external members, and what was the overall size of the audit committee? There are no specific guidelines on the size, and this is something that we can come back to again during our question and answer period, because the size of the audit committee may depend on the size of the organization, the complexity of the organization, as well as the mission and scope of work. And you can see that for our sample in general, the audit committee did tend to be small. Most organizations reported one to two members or three to four members as sort of the modal size. And in general, they tended to have fewer external members. So that may be an area for discussion, and again, may vary from organization to organization. An important 
task of the board in providing financial oversight, in mitigating risks facing organizations, and in providing uh, boundary spanning functions as we discussed, is the importance of orientation. Orientation materials provide an excellent introduction to an organization. And here, consistent with Tom's findings, we do actually uh, learn that organizations across the board are doing a relatively strong job in providing boards with orientation materials. In fact, 98% provided overviews of their mission, programming, and services. They also identified board member roles and responsibilities, um, and 93% provided information about ethics policies. Where we saw perhaps less uh, coverage, uh, areas where board members were not receiving extensive information were, for example, in information about pro bono services, acceptance policies for those only half, provided board orientation materials, um, and also only 37% were providing board members with uh, information about trends in their specific subsector. We also saw about 64% uh, were providing information about financial risk management procedures. So in general, the view here is that most organizations are doing a very good job with uh, their orientation materials, but there are areas that could uh, be improved, and those are specifically noted here. Uh, finally, uh, we look at the orientation as well as the review of materials. We asked organizations specifically about how frequently the board reviews internal policies and what areas are reviewed more frequently than others. Uh, interestingly, given some of the changes that have taken place, we saw that code of ethics policies were reviewed in the 2007-2009 period, so that might coincide with the IRS uh, changes, and those have not been reviewed as recently. So only 14% have reviewed those code of ethics policies in 2010. We looked specifically around records retention. This is an area where nonprofits are also trying to implement best practices, and many of them have uh, changed their approach to this more recently. And we uh, saw in the data that uh, fewer organizations have reviewed these in the most recent period. However, uh, debt policy uh, seems to have been reviewed the most recently, with 79% saying that the board reviewed this in 2010, and only 13% saying they were reviewed in the 2007-2009 period. Uh, I think the view that emerges from looking at these review, uh, reviews is that some areas are reviewed more frequently than others, uh, with specific interest in the code of ethics uh, policies that organizations can implement. Now, we did uh, study more carefully how review, uh, the review process varies by organizational size. We looked at very small organizations and saw some interesting changes, and in particular, um, smaller organizations seem to have been more likely to review their cash management policy and gift acceptance policy as well as records retention in the most recent period, in the 2010 period. As we look at larger organizations, um, these did not tend to be reviewed as, as recently. In other words, the gift acceptance, cash management, and records retention policies were not reviewed in the most recent period um, as frequently as we saw for the smaller organizations. And then for the larger organizations, there seems to also be a sense that um, these were these policies are reviewed more frequently. So we see that larger organizations and small organizations tend to review their their policies more frequently compared to the mid-sized organizations. I think the main uh, insights that emerge from the next slide is how often the board is involved in various aspects of the organization. Tom's uh, presentation focused on the role the board can play in oversight, but there's also the role that the board can play in, in the planning process. And we see that in general, boards are very actively involved in strategic planning for organizations, in capital project planning, um, as well as in a more comprehensive way of reviewing annually income and expenses against budget, a uh, cash forecast, as well as an operating budget. Um, so the main uh, areas that we wanted to emphasize is it does seem like boards are more involved in the analysis of income and expenses, uh, but these are often uh, reviewed quarterly. A question that we raised is how often should boards be involved in reviewing these materials? Should this be annually? Should it be on a quarterly basis uh, or even more frequently than that? 
Another area of interest as we think about the role the board can play in financial management is what specific areas boards tend to be involved in and what areas they're less involved in. Where are the gaps and where are the strong areas? Now, in general, the view that emerges from our studies is that boards are very active in areas of financial accountability as well as strategic planning. Uh, Two-thirds of organizations say that their boards are very active in financial accountability. About half say their boards are involved in strategic planning. Uh, where we see less board involvement, surprisingly for us, is in the fundraising area. 24%, so about a quarter of our sample, say the board is not active in fundraising. This is actually a big surprise given that most board members uh, generally do assume that they're going to play a role in helping in resource development for an organization. We also saw that board members are generally not as involved in debt restructuring and budget development. And so this was a, these represent opportunities, we think, for many nonprofits to engage board members. As we wrap up our slide, I'd like to point out some areas where we, uh, our results are consistent with existing work and also areas where uh, they suggest further research can be done. In general, our results show that boards are very actively involved in financial management, and boards of effective organizations do tend to be more involved in financial planning and control. We also find some interesting results around board size, that board size is uh, positively related to program spending and fundraising performance. One very interesting area for future research, which I think we started to um, do some work in, and I think Tom's results also point to this, that donations, receiving outside donations as well as receiving government funding, tend to be positively associated with six of the factors that um, capture good governance. I should note, however, that we're not saying that these are causal, that receiving charitable donations leads to better governance, but that these two tend to go hand in hand and more research is needed to actually um, establish causality. We also learned, and this is consistent with existing research, that board effectiveness, how effective the board is, does seem to be linked to an organization's financial health and performance, especially for nonprofits that rely on outside funding, whether that's funding from private donors, foundations, corporate donors, or government grants. Now, there is limited research, and I think this is an area where there's more work needed to better understand which monitoring mechanisms actually are most effective and how frequently organizations use them. In particular, our results show that the uh, presence of an independent audit committee is not as widespread as perhaps uh, we might believe, but that different sources of funding may lead to differences in how the audit co committee is composed and how it functions. In general, though, we did see that organizations that have audit committees and use outside monitoring uh, mechanisms such as uh, external auditors tend to be associated with better internal uh, quality and more effective programming. Uh, this is something we, uh, we'd love to learn more about and hear uh, your feedback on, so welcome questions on this. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Dennis for the uh, last uh, set of presentation material. Thank you very much, uh, Una. We're glad to have a chance to join this conversation uh, this afternoon. And um, governance is an incredibly important topic. And, um, and governance is really always a factor in assessing the credit quality of nonprofits. Um, and as Una has highlighted, um, we're not necessarily in normal times and in a period of slow growth, in the period following uh, the recession. Some, uh, while some nonprofits are thriving, uh, many others are struggling and often uh, enhanced governance can make a difference in allowing a nonprofit to thrive uh, in a more competitive climate. As a credit analyst, I spent a lot of time with financial statements developing quantitative measures of financial strength um, along the way. And while those numeric indicators are important, the assessment of governance and management is just as important, if not more important, to getting a future look on uh, the financial health of an organization. And, um, and this review of governance is crucial to understanding how the organization may be well or less well equipped to handle struggles over time. 
So one of the things that we've heard, heard in the earlier uh, slides is that size matters. And if you think about the hundreds of thousands of nonprofits in the U.S., Moody's rates just around 1,000 of those, and they do tend to be larger organizations. But, um, but we do um, recognize that, there's a, that within this variety of size, there's a need um, to think through um, how that variation might correspond to changes in the policy. And so if you think about the 990 form that has a checkbox, is there a conflict of interest policy or is there not, um, instead of just a yes, no, most of the rated organizations would have those, we try to assess is that conflict of interest policy well uh, adjusted to the needs of the organization, is it thoughtfully developed, and is it complied with and administered well. So a, a bit of a, a different uh, turn than just a yes, no question, but understanding how the governance works and how it changes over time. Una's study also highlighted that these things aren't static, and as you'd expect, policies can and do and, and, and probably should change over time with changing um, uh, conditions. And so the frequency of the review is part of, part of the story of assessing a nonprofit's governance. And when you think about while many of the organizations we rate are larger, in any given week we may be meeting with and assessing organizations of a very different size. So it could be a $3 million organization, $30 million in revenues, $300 million, or even $3 billion. And you'd expect those uh, different organizations with vastly different scale to have different levels of resources to devote uh, to governance, all of them um, uh, uh, to fulfill their duties and need to um, be a, a held to a certain account, um, but that uh, a big range and that we wouldn't necessarily expect a $3 million organization to have the, the diversity uh, and the resources to handle some of these governance questions but still um, perform um, at, a, at an adequate level relative to the size. So across um, this slide and the next six, we've um, crystallized uh, um, a few ideas key to our methodology of understanding how governance uh, works and impacts nonprofit credit health. And none of the ideas in their basic um, form are revolutionary for the sector, uh, all part of, of um, our methodology, but have tried here to lay out not only the basic idea but for each, the financial benefit, the organizational culture, and the future impact. And there are, as we think about the cultural issues, there are genuine uh, differences in the nonprofit sector. And we're trying to understand how, how this organization thinks, how it works, and it, and it helps um, to objectively uh, project how it might respond to challenges in the future. So the diversity of opinion is the basic idea uh, of this slide and, and do uh, view the issues such as director independence as care, a core to credit uh, quality. We rate a, a wide variety of nonprofits, um, have some, uh, have rated some with boards as few as three members all related, so obviously not a very diverse opinion, but getting the, the scale right uh, for the oversight board is important. Um, we've also seen cases where the boards are objectively too large, or they're um, large enough that they're not effectively um, governing um, with the board, say, of over 80 members and able to address um, the challenges. And there may be other ways that that organization could enlist the support and enthusiasm of those members, but not in the core governing board. And so finding the right balance, finding the right diversity of opinion um, is an important part of credit quality. In terms of the board's oversight role, it's also a crucial element of, of assessing governance quality. Um, the survey showed, as, as you might expect, that most boards were engaged in setting the strategic course of the organization. Um, we've also included here the idea that oversight of the CEO um, is an important um, um, board job, and this um, review and uh, careful um, division of powers between the senior staff and the board 
uh, is both an art and a science and, and something that some uh, nonprofits excel at. On the, um, on the topic of how these oversight um, issues can change over time, New York State recently uh, passed a nonprofit revitaliz revitalization act and amongst other things address topics like related party transactions. So after that passed, nonprofits in New York um, held to a different standard, um, have reviewed and are reviewing their standards on many fronts, including related party transactions. And so sometimes this um, regulatory environment uh, can change how the board's oversight role is realized. On the next slide, we highlight the, uh, the commitment to disclosure as a credit positive indicator. And the disclosure can be both internal but also external. And so nonprofits that are used to explaining their impact, their, the resources that they have to deliver um, the impact, and their financial health tend to be um, stronger credits, that this commitment to disclosure um, yield some financial benefit in terms of explaining the story, engaging donors and grantors, um, and the broader community, and in enhancing uh, confidence. And this um, ability to track the organization's impact over time does have important cultural impacts um, and holds organizations uh, to greater account. I also would like to highlight um, planning, and this can be uh, a great tool to optimize resource, uh, resources that are always uh, finite. And it's really a, a distinguishing feature of many not-for-profits that we rate. And if you think about the planning horizon that especially endowed institutions have that are running endowments that are held in, with a perpetual planning horizon, they have time to make uh, plans over a very long period, can be more thoughtful and planful in their approach. And if you think of, uh, about this, it's very different from, say, say, a public institution with elected leadership that may be on a two- or four-year re-election cycle, or even corporate boards where there might be greater finance on quarter-over-quarter quarter financial results and not as much focus on the very long term. And so some not nonprofits really um, excel at that. There's also the topic here in terms of, of, of the best plans involve some kind of stress testing. And often uh, we're meeting with an organization, perhaps they're thinking about a new venture, a new capital program, um, and, and they are optimistic about that. And so part of our job is assessing, is that optimism well-founded? And, and in engaging with the, the board and the management team, um, you can surmise how, how well-founded is the optimism, how grounded in things that they, uh, that they can present are they, um, and also how have they tested if, if for example, the fundraising efforts don't meet targets in either terms of amount or timing, or if the earned revenue, if that's part of the proposal, doesn't pan out how would the organization respond? The next topic is uh, benchmarking. And this is an important tool that helps a nonprofit um, evaluate its competitive landscape. It's a, when it's done well, it it's, um, uh, can be a very powerful tool. Finding the right peers can be a challenge. Um, but, um, but when done thoughtfully, really allows um, allows the nonprofit to understand its relative strengths and challenges um, and fosters a commitment to continuous improvement. Related to benchmarking is just a broader uh, process of self-assessment. And um, the best run nonprofits tend to have some key performance indicators uh, that allow an assessment uh, over time. Um, in those strongest cases, it's usually closely tied to the strategy, to the broader strategic plan um, that includes at least some measurable outcomes. So the board or other interested stakeholders um, can, can consider is, is the organization on the right track. And this is not just um, uh, the, the purview of, of giant organizations. We've seen smaller organizations develop um, incredibly thoughtful and powerful 
performance indicators um, that, that help the organization um, stay on its strategic course. The last of these uh, basic idea slides involves stakeholder relationships. And this focus here is on evaluating the landscape of potential political and regulatory hurdles. We've been through an era of, of uh, rapidly evolving um, uh, standards in many sectors, including uh, nonprofits. And, and we seek to answer the question, how well equipped is the board and management to handle those hurdles? And sometimes the politics here is often local. So an organization may want to expand, and then there's neighborhood relations. Sometimes these issues are regional, national, at times even international. So the, the number of stakeholders varies broadly by organization, but maintaining those healthy relationships and having the board's engagement in that um, is, is an important distinguishing feature of nonprofits. So we have included some of the references and resources here in the slides that will be available on the website. Uh, but in uh, closing, just uh, want to repeat that effective governance and strong management are, are necessary for a nonprofit to fulfill its mission, and that an assessment of governance is crucial to Moody's ratings of nonprofits. And th this assessment is made in the context of, their, of the broader landscape the nonprofit exists in, of its resources and challenges, and also where it is in its life cycle. Is it in a growth mode or mature, for example? And, uh, and much of this, I think, corresponds with the data from the 990 forms and from the recent survey. I look forward to our discussion. And with that, Una, I'd like to turn the floor back to you. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. And thank you to all of you who have been uh, with us for the webinar. Um, we very much appreciate uh, all of you staying on for the question and answer period. And we've already received a number of very, very thought-provoking, interesting questions. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank our presenters, but also ask them if they can respond to some of those questions that have already come in uh, via our chat function. If you're um, on, there is a question box that you can send your questions to right away. And we'll start with Tom, because he actually has a list of questions already, to feel. And then we'll go around uh, the rest of the presenters and address the questions that are coming in. Okay. Well, let me just start out with a, a clarification. Um, one person asked, is not a document destruction policy detrimental for transparency and accountability? Um, to clarify, the the policies at issue here document retention and destruction policies. So typically, these policies include, require organizations to retain documents and emails and items that may be important should there be any sort of investigation of the organization in the future. At the same time, the destruction policies typically apply to um, you know, documents related that, that may have an impact on you know, patient or client um, privacy concerns. Um, so, so there, there's both sort of types of of, of of questions at stake in a, in a good document retention and, and disruption policy. Um, moving moving quickly on to to other questions here. Um, organizations having audits. Was there a difference between small nonprofits and 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 large? Um, I think there's a related question also ask, asking about whether we can kind of tease apart the, the percentage of organizations that had their financial statements um, you know, formally audited by, by a CPA or accountant and those that merely had, had reviews or had their financial statements compiled by an accountant. And, and unfortunately, for purposes of this, studies, we did, this study, we did not delve into that in detail. but. Um, I would be happy to to do a few extra runs, and we can post them along with our, the, the presentation on the website um, within the next within the next week. Okay, and I will go through my questions very quickly, and then turn it over to Dennis. Um, so we had some questions about the audit committee and how it should be composed, and in particular um, whether you should select outside members, CPAs, etc. The IRS website does have some recommendations on the audit committee, and that's something we can actually send you the link to, especially the 
uh, person to ask those questions. In general, the IRS guideline does uh, specifically say that organizations should have um, the Form 990 reviewed um, using in the process of either a finance or audit committee. And there is a recommendation that at least one finance professional should be on the audit committee. Um, organizations may vary in how this is done, and this is something we can send as a follow-up in terms of resource materials. Uh, we also received a question about the best practice for records retention. How long should organizations keep financial records before they dispose of them? And again, this will vary by organizational size, function, and complexity. And this is something that the board can actually help uh, develop and review a policy around this. I think the important thing is to have a policy, to have it vetted, and to make sure that it is uh, adapted to the needs of the organization. This may change over time, depending on regulatory requirements, but also programmatic requirements as well. And with that, um, Dennis had a few questions to respond to. I hope you get through all of those. But please keep your questions coming. Very good. Um, thank you, Una. And um, one question uh, came in uh, relative to Moody's um, published ratings and, and are they available publicly? And the answer is yes. And um, um, everyone um, is able to uh, to have some access to Moody's.com on the website. I can also um, provide uh, if you're especially interested in other not-for-profits. Um, so that would be the, the, the non-profits that aren't healthcare or higher education. Uh, we do publish uh, annual medians reports, and there's a relatively fresh version. Um, so if you're interested in that, we can uh, follow up on that. It includes not only medians for the sector and subsectors like service advocacy versus philanthropic or cultural groups, um, but also lists the ratings at the time of the publication and the names of the rated entities um, in the back. So that might um, be helpful there. Okay, Dennis, a few other questions came in specifically about uh, social enterprise organizations and hybrid forms of nonprofits that are emerging and whether the ratings methodology would be adapted or perhaps even revised in, in light of that sort of changing complexity of what it means to be a nonprofit, whether Moody is thinking about that or is that in, is something on your radar as well? So it, it is um, something that uh, we're watching and to, in some cases there's some um, some merging of uh, nonprofit and for-profit uh, roles, and um, at, from time to time, we do partner with our uh, Moody's colleagues who work in uh, uh, corporate ratings, and um, and it is a time of fast, um, uh, increasing evolution as the as the question. So it's a good uh, question. Very good. I think the uh, other general question, which I would like both uh, perhaps Tom as well as Dennis to speak on, is uh, as organizations think about what might be a best practice around audits, around uh, records retention, some of the questions we've heard, uh, what are some sort of general themes for organizations to consider? If the goal is to promote transparency and accountability, uh, what are some specific sort of areas that you think deserve further research or attention? I guess more of a general closing question. Well, I think certainly, you know, assessing the risk for your particular organization is is, is key. You know, if you're a small volunteer-led organization where there's a great deal of interaction already between volunteers or maybe one or two staff people and the board, the formal formal processes are probably less important. And if you're a large organization where interactions between board and, and, and staff and other components of the, the operation are, are much less frequent. Um, in preparing for this webinar, I, one of my colleagues also looked at um, the percentage of um, kind of related party transactions among the organizations filing 990s. And, the percentages are surprisingly high. We actually found there are around 10% of organizations com completed um, Schedule L. Now we haven't really teased that apart yet, but you know I think that that certainly does highlight the, the importance of good governance practices here. Since you know there are a lot of interactions between um, between organizations and people that are related to those organizations that have financial interests with them. 
So I think that that you know once again so highlights the importance of having those independent board members who who can take it in a, a appropriately independent view of those transactions. Dennis, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. I think in, in preparing, we did talk about life cycle and how organizations evolve and establish as they grow, perhaps, stronger governance policies and best practices in this area. I don't know if you could perhaps speak to that in sort of closing this webinar. Right, now that's um, a good issue. Uh, as we mentioned, this, you wouldn't expect these government governance issues to be static across the life organization, uh, life cycle of an organization. And when we're looking at a, a, a nonprofit that's either in rapid uh, growth mode or maybe in a, a paring down mode, that that you'd expect very different kind of governance stance um, and, and different kinds of, of risk management practices. And so, um, so that is part of the story, and that governance should be viewed in, in light of where the organization is in the cycle. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Thank you to our presenters, to our participants, and to all of you who joined this uh, discussion today. As we mentioned, this will be posted on the website of all these organizations. And we look forward to your questions. The email addresses are listed here, and they can be addressed to the presenters. Um, and thank you again. We look forward to having you join us for the third uh, webinar that will be coming up very shortly. Thank you.